In this video, we're going to look at just one method, which should tell you immediately that this is a complicated method. It's called Create Enemy, and responsible for launching either a penguin or a bomb into the air for the player to swipe. That's it, that's all it does. And yet, it's gonna take quite a lot of code to do that, because it takes quite a lot of functionality in order to make the game complete. First, should this enemy be a penguin or a bomb? Second, where should it be created on the screen? And third, what direction should it be moving in? It should be obvious that three relies on two, because if you create something on the left edge of the screen, having it move to the left would make the game impossible for players. An additional complexity here is that in the early stages of the game, we sometimes want to force a bomb and sometimes force a penguin in order to build a smooth learning curve. For example, it wouldn't be fair to make the very first enemy a bomb because the player would swipe it and lose immediately. We're going to specify what kind of enemy we want using an enum called force bomb. Let's make it now. Up here we'll say enum force bomb has the cases never, never force a bomb, always force a bomb, or have some random behavior. Might be a bomb, might not be a bomb. In order to start using create enemy, we've got to track the enemies we currently have. This will be a new array called active enemies. I'll make a new array down here in our property list called var active enemies is an array of sk sprite node. And that'll track all the active enemies in our game, all the ones that are currently on the game scene. So let's dive in and start writing create enemy. Go down here and say func create enemy. And I'll make this thing take one parameter called force bomb, which will be an instance of our enum force bomb with a default value of dot random. Just do the random thing. And there's a default value there because by default, most of the game will be random. But sometimes, initially to start with at least, we'll say here's a bomb or here's never a bomb. So we can say let enemy is some sort of SK sprite node. The enemy type we'll say is uh, int.random in zero through six. So we're gonna use this thing to make sure we have really random distribution of whether it's a bomb or a penguin. I'll consider zero to mean it's a bomb. But of course, if we've said that our force bomb parameter is never, this is definitely not a bomb, we'll force enemy type to be one. Conversely, if force bomb is set to dot always, always make this thing a bomb, then we'll say enemy type is zero. Make it definitely a bomb. Next, we'll instantiate an SK sprite node using either the penguin or the bomb. We'll do the bomb shortly. Let's focus on penguin for now. We'll say if enemy type is zero, then bomb code goes here. Else, our enemy is a new SK sprite node with the image named penguin. And we'll immediately run on our game scene a new SK action playing the sound file named launch.caf. The sound of a penguin being launched in the air, whatever that sounds like. And don't wait for completion. We'll name this thing enemy. So we know it's been sliced as a penguin. After that condition, there's some more code to come. We'll just do position code goes here for now. More importantly, we're gonna add to the game scene that enemy sprite and add it to our active enemies array. So we can track where it is in the game scene. Now there are two big errors here saying constant enemy used before being initialized. That's because if any type is zero, this code here, bomb code goes here, will be called and our enemy will not have a value by the time it reaches this point here. And that's actually not allowed in Swift. You can see we're saying it definitely has a sprite node. It might not have a sprite node. Therefore, this code is dangerous. Don't worry, we'll fill that in shortly. For now, I want to replace this comment here. Position code goes here. This is going to give the enemy a random position off the bottom edge of the screen, give them a random angular velocity, which if you recall, is how fast the thing spins. It'll create a random X velocity, how far to move, that takes into account the enemy's position. It'll create a random Y velocity to make things fly at different speeds. And then give them all a circular physics body where the collision bit mask is set to zero so they don't collide. 
The only thing that might catch you out here in the actual code is my use of magic numbers, which is what coders call seemingly random but actually important numbers appearing in code. Ideally, you don't want these because it's better to make them constants with names. But then, how to be able to give you any homework? So let's dive in now. We'll say let random position equals a CG point with x being int dot random in 64 on the left through to 960 on the right. So most of the screen. But always y being minus 128. So off the bottom edge of the screen. I'm going to assign that to be our enemy's position. So it'll start at that random position. Next, we're going to create a random velocity, both angular and movement, for our enemy. We'll say uh, let random angular velocity equals cg float dot random in minus three through three. So some amount of spin. For its movement speed, we'll say let random x velocity is some sort of int. And now look at the position to judge how fast that velocity should be. We'll say if random position dot x is less than 256, if it's way to the left of our screen, then we'll make our random x velocity quite high, so it moves to the right quite dramatically. We'll say random x velocity equals int dot random in 8 through 15. Else if random position dot x is less than 512, so it's on the left side of our screen, but not the extreme left, then random x velocity equals int dot random in three through five. So move to the right gently. Else if random position dot x is less than seven, six, eight, so the right part of our screen, but not the extreme right, then random x velocity is int dot random in three through five again. But this time I'll make this minus int dot random so it moves to the left. And finally, all other cases, else random x velocity is minus int dot random in 8 through 15. So it's on the far right of the screen, move to the left very quickly. As for its y velocity, that's easy enough. We'll say let random y velocity equals int dot random in 24 through 32. Again, these are magic numbers, numbers I've just tried and tested out using trial and error and found to work great in the game. Now all that's done, we can create a physics body for our enemy and assign those as velocity and angular velocity, remembering to use a collision bit mask of zero so we know they won't bounce off each other. We'll say enemy dot physics body equals an SK physics body with a circle of radius being half the size of our sprites, which is 128, the full size, so half is 64. Then enemy dot physics body, question mark dot velocity, half has to move, is a CG vector. And for the X we'll say is random X velocity, multiplied by some large number, to make it more extreme, I found 40 works well. And for y is random y velocity times 40. Then enemy dot physics body, question mark dot angular velocity, how fast to spin is our random angular velocity. Enemy dot physics body, question mark dot collision bit mask equals zero. Bounce off nothing in the game. Now the last missing part of the create enemy method is about creating bombs. And if it's separate because it requires some thinking. A bomb node in our game is actually going to be made up of three parts. The bomb image, a bomb fuse path limiter, and a container that puts the two together so we can move and spin them around together, just like the fireworks in Fireworks Night. If you recall, the reason we have to keep the bomb image and bomb fuse separate is because tapping on a bomb is a fatal move that causes the player to lose all the lives immediately. If the fuse path limiter were inside the bomb image, and the user could accidentally tap a stray fuse particle and lose unfairly. As a reminder, we're going to force the Z position of bombs to be one, which is higher than the default value of zero. This is so that bombs always appear in front of penguins, because trust me, 
hours of playtesting has made it clear to me it's awful if you don't realize there's a bomb lurking behind something when you swipe it. Creating a bomb also needs to play a fuse sound, but that has its own complexity. You've already seen that SK Action has a very simple way to play sounds, but it's so simple that it's not useful here, because we want to be able to stop the sound, and sounds played using SK Action make that hard. It would of course be confusing for the few sounds we're playing when no bombs are visible, so we need a better solution. That solution is called AV Audio Player, and it's not a sprite kit class. It's available to use in your UI kit apps too if you want to. We're going to have an AV Audio Player property for our class that will store a sound just for bomb fuses so we can use it as needed. Let's start writing some code. We'll start by pulling in the framework for that, which is import AV Foundation. That gives us AV Audio Player. So now we have AV Foundation in, let's make our property. We'll say var bombs sound effect is an AV Audio Player. Optional, like that. And now for the real work. I'll go down and find that code, bomb code goes here. Here it is, bomb code goes here. We're gonna replace that with the code to make a bomb with the emitter and play the sound. So first we'll say enemy equals an SK sprite node, just empty by itself. This will be the container to hold other things. Previously in the fireworks game, we used SK node here, and this is very similar. We're using SK sprite node only because enemy has already been declared to be an SK sprite node up there. We make this thing have a Z position of one, so it appears ahead of other things, including the penguins and name this thing bomb container. So we know what it is when the game is running. Next up, we'll make our bomb image by saying let bomb image equals SK sprite node using image named slice bomb. Make sure I name this thing something obvious. We'll do name equals bomb and then enemy dot add child bomb image. So add that to our container node. Next, if the bomb sound effects not nil, i.e. if it's currently got a value, we'll stop it and destroy it. So it's made from scratch and played from scratch every single time. We'll say, if bomb sound effect is not equal to nil, then bomb sound effect, question mark, dot stop. And bomb sound effect equals nil. These two make sure, absolute certain, the bomb sound effect stops every single time. Next, we want to find slicebombfuse.caf inside our bundle. So we'll say, if let path equals bundle dot main dot URL for resource slice bomb fuse with extension caf. Find that sound file inside our bundle. And if that succeeds, great. We can try and load that into an AV audio player. We'll say if let sound equals try question mark AV audio player using the contents of URL initializer, passing our path. And if that succeeds, great, we can say bomb sound effect equals that sound and sound up play. Play it immediately. At this point, if we made it past all this condition up here, then we know for sure it has succeeded we can try and also show an emitter node behind it. We'll say, if let emitter is an SK emitter node, using the file named slice fuse, then emitter.position equals CG point. Again, magic numbers, 76 for X and 64 for Y, enemy.addchild that emitter. Now these values here, again, that is tried and tested. If you look at the picture we're loading, this slice bomb picture, it's in our assets up here. Uh, it is this one here. You can see the fuse is somewhere over here. So it's up and to the right of our main picture. So I've figured out that it's 7664 gets us the fuse to appear at exactly that point there. After all that work, you're almost done with bombs. But there's one small bug we can either fix now or fix when you see it, but we might as well fix it now because your brain's thinking about all that bomb code. The bug is this. We're using AV Audio Player so we can stop the bomb fuse when bombs are no longer on the screen. But where do we actually stop the sound? 
Well, we don't yet, but we need to. To fix the bug, we need to modify the update method. This method's called average frame before it's drawn and gives us a chance to update the game state as we want. We're going to use this method to count the number of bomb containers that exist in our game and stop the fuse sound if the answer is zero. So back in game scene, I'll add a new update method. There it is, update current time. We'll start by saying var bomb count is zero. So assume there are no bombs. And now loop over all the nodes in active enemies, a whole array of enemies. If the node name happens to be bomb container, fantastic. We'll say uh, bomb count plus equals one. And in fact, all we really need is one bomb to know the few sounds you're playing. So I'll just do break straight away to exit that loop. And below, if bomb count is now zero, it means we have no bombs, so we should stop the fuse sound. And that means saying bomb sound effect, question mark dot stop, bomb sound effect equals nil. Stop it, then destroy it. 